hope everybody is motivated as I am. You know, we take some things for granted, some things we don't. You know, I was just talking to a few of you, and a lot of you didn't realize that I had surgery on August 28th on my back. What well, it was supposed to be a routine 30, 40 minute surgery. Wind up taking five hours and 27 minutes. So, uh, you know, I am blessed to be here to do the things I like to do the most. And, and that's to do basketball. This gets me away. Like Gary said, this is really my passion. So, and if someone's asking, are you going to be able to run? Well, I'm already 10 games into it. I'm way ahead of schedule. So, which leads me to another thing. Let's not wait till the season starts. December 2nd. It's right up on us. Start getting in shape. We have it. Let's start doing it. We don't want those early injuries to come about. We got a lot to cover. We're going to get you out of here in a reasonable time. So, without it, we'll go ahead and get started. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's go bring up Shelly Rush. We're going to talk about the new official. Uh, we're just going to recognize the new officials, and um, and then the new officials we're going to go over to the other end. Uh, and we're going to do some things over there. So first of all, I want to recognize Robert Nahmarau, who is the
uh, Saturday. What a cool deal he did with us about processing plates. And you know, we talk about a lot of stuff. But the nuts and bolts are in order your game and doing what you do at that moment in time. So Ray Lutz was one of our guys. Why? <laughs> Technology. Uh, the other noticeable referee is Kevin Kazuski. Is Kevin here? Uh, he put our, our uh, <coughs> state planning. How many? Put your hand up if you were there uh, Saturday. How about in Denver? Okay. Put your hand up. You were there. Cool. All right. Well, it was, uh, I thought, very well done. Uh, and uh, Kevin put a lot of work behind the scenes guy that makes an impact in your world. That's the kind of people that are. Cool. Plus, he's a pretty cool guy. Plus, he's a pretty damn good official. I think he has uh, 12 Division One, and he's worked and gone to camp. And uh, man, it's doable if you if you work at it or are passionate about this deal. Another notable rep is Bob Lancy. Okay, give him a hand. <laughs> about him, it's about his meticulous ways that he does things, and he's professional in everything he does. You can call him about your assignment, he'll tell you, dude, lady, you're not, you're not, you're not, ready, you're not ready yet. Why am I, why am I not at 125? We've got all kinds of discussions about it. If I'm at 150, why am I not at 125? Well, he can tell you. And uh, he's uh, a, a big eyeball person. And keeps us in touch with that group on East Coast. Uh, so he's very valuable. He does. You have no idea what he does during the day. It's incredible. Putting out fires and switching guys around, and the, the JV thing is coming out. And I don't. I don't know if any of you know if you if you could do it or would want to do it and have the ability to do it. But noticeable rep is Bob Lansing. Another noticeable rep. Is Andy Heal? Where are you, Andy? <laughs> he had, he, he had uh, a, a slideshow that would have taken me a week to do. He did it in about 30 minutes. So we're tapping some resources in our group, and we appreciate him uh, what he does for our group. And uh, he's going to take a lead in some other things. Uh, he's videotaping our meetings. You can go home, but you can't get credit if you're home. That's a weird good credit. All right. So those are, those are some notable referees. And the other notable referee is right here, Bill Huffman. Give a nice hand. And uh, a pretty vocal, hands-on, wants to get things done, doesn't mess around. Wants to do it now, not tomorrow, wants it done now. Good qualities. We've had to touch him a couple of times. He's hold it down. Bill. But we need people like that. All those behind the scenes people are cool. All right, tonight I'm going to do a 12 minute presentation, if you can believe that. Rule 12, <laughs> and Rule 10 6 is all about contact. The first five articles say shall. And we in Colorado Springs are pretty good about contact. And you know, if you've been watching 29 hours of basketball, how many watch one or two games? Okay? All right. Every single game, they put something about the new rule about contact. It'll filter down to us. But the first time in the rule book, on page 64, I believe, it talks about balance, rhythm, speed, and quickness for the first time. So now we know what to do with our contact. So this video is really cool. Hope you can hear it. Maybe you can hear it. We'll try it. Okay, we're ready to go. Go. Okay, we can maybe turn the lights down. That'd be helpful. Somebody hit those. Contact being ruled or not ruled during basketball games is currently a hot topic at all levels. 
Contact is defined as the state or condition of physically touching. Thus, the difficulty with this concept in basketball isn't the definition, it is how does an official decide what is legal versus illegal contact. Then if you think about all the specific types of contact that could and do occur in basketball games, from holding and pushing with the arms, body or legs, to swinging of the arms and elbows, from impeding progress to displacement, from incidental to flagrant contact, this becomes a definite challenge. Thus, it should be evident to see the complexity of the topic of contact, as not all touching is considered illegal contact, and thus ruled about. <coughs> as we officiate, let's keep in mind that the rules for contact apply to both teams, as well as the offense and defense. Aggressiveness is permissible in the game of basketball, so long as that aggressiveness falls within the parameters of legal play and legal contact. There are a few basic principles governing the actions of players at all times. First, it is the responsibility of each player to avoid contact in every reasonable way. Second, any player is entitled to take any spot on the court so long as he or she gets there first and the position is not occupied by an opponent and in so doing he or she does not cause contact directly or indirectly and last if contact occurs the foul is on the player who is primarily responsible <coughs> let's think about illegal contact relating to the dribbler or ball handler here is a great picture of a ball handler and his defender don't automatically fall into the trap of saying that this is definitely a player control foul. Still photos are great for discussion, but often the whole story is missing. All of the information you need to make a ruling or to have the answer isn't there. Did the defensive player establish and maintain legal guarding position? Did the offensive player merely have his arm up protecting the ball? Or in the next sequence, did he extend his arm forward making contact? All of these are great points to ponder and discuss to help us learn about contact. <clears throat> Here are some other guidelines that can help you more definitively decide on legal versus illegal contact. Is there inadvertent touching or brushing of the hand? Legal contact. Is there a straight arm? No bend in the elbow where holding, pushing, or displacing occurs? Illegal contact. How is the arm bar, forearm that is away from the body, being used by the defender? Is it placed there in a typical guarding manner? Legal contact. Is it being used to hold, push, or displace? Illegal contact. defending the ball from the defense by shielding the ball with his or her back. Legal contact is a dribbler backing down the defender and displacing the defender once the defender has established legal guarding position. Illegal contact. <laughs> Making a move to the basket, did the defender come forward making contact with the offensive player? Illegal contact. While making a move to the basket, did the offensive player bump into the chest of the defender who is maintaining verticality? Illegal contact. <laughs> and studying contact situations is to apply the RSVP. 
Q principle. R rhythm. Did the offensive player keep his or her natural basketball rhythm of motion, or was it disturbed in any way? If so, how? And who is responsible for the illegal contact? S. Speed. Did the speed of any player involved change due to contact by one or more players? If so, how? And who is responsible for the illegal contact? B. Balance. Did the balance of any player get knocked off its natural course? If so, how? And who is responsible for the illegal contact? Q, quickness. Did any player's ability to accelerate become affected in any way? If so, how? And who is responsible for the illegal contact? One other point to ponder, referencing RSBQ to help you make decisions, is ask yourself the following. Is there marginal contact where the RSBQ of the offensive player is not affected. This is some tricky territory, but usually this will not be really bound. Now let's examine and discuss some plays to help us apply the rules for legal versus illegal contact. Remember, as you examine these plays, Keep in mind the criteria we just discussed for determining legal versus illegal contact. Viewing plays, your own or others, is a great way to improve your decision making on contact plays. In this play, there is marginal contact on white number 44 as she shoots and scores. The official ruled correctly that this was not a foul. play, watch as the ball handler, wearing green, dribbles to the far side of the court. There is marginal contact between the two players and no foul was ruled correctly. Watch as green number 24 secures a loose ball after a misstrike for goal. This is more than marginal contact and can't be ignored. The official correctly rules a foul. In this play, there is a displacement foul by the offense. Initially, the offensive player illegally contacts the defender by pushing her arm away and then proceeds to back down the defender. By ruling this foul, the subsequent action then is avoided. On this play, this is not verticality by green number 24. The official correctly rules a foul for illegal contact with the shooter. Initially, white number three does not establish legal guarding position and illegally contacts the ball handler. This should have been ruled a foul. By ruling this foul, the subsequent action, which is also illegal, is avoided.
watch as white number three steals the ball, drives the length of the court where she is illegally contacted by green number 22. The defender affects the RSBQ of the offensive player, and this should have been ruled a foul. Illegal contact by the offensive team in green amounts to white number three off the balance and should have been ruled a foul. In summary, remember that legal versus illegal contact plays are at the crux of every basketball game. It would be a lot simpler if officials only had to monitor scoring and violations or removing players in a confined area. There's for certain bound to be contact for us to make decisions about. If you apply the rules as written, the key principles like RSBQ, and keep in mind that can be different types and severity of contact. You'll be well on your way to being successful the eyeball way. One rule, one interpretation. Good lights. Okay, hopefully that will give you some guidelines and a checklist that you're thinking about contact. Look at some casebook plays. Good stuff in there. Uh, we're the new rule part of our journey. Where there's four new rules, four editorial changes, and four points of emphasis. And we had it Saturday. If you are interested, I'm going to do a 10 minute presentation down here in these first three or four rows after the meeting. If you care to check that out, you can go on Arbiter and click right to the National Federation's website. Boom, right there. Everything that we'll talk about, there's I think 22 slides. Okay. Uh, thank you for listening. You didn't have to listen to me, listen to somebody else. That's good. Uh, let's see. Uh, Bill, I think you're going to I'm going to be a lot quicker than I was last week, I promise. Uh, so let's talk about a couple of constitutional things real quick uh, to get that out of the way. So my appeals committee proposal is dead in the water. Um, and I'll get to the reason why in a second. Uh, what we decided to do as an executive committee is uh, identify three individuals who we think are going to be uh, what we're going to call a constitution review committee. It's been a few years since we've had our constitution reviewed in total. So these three gentlemen are Carlos Hernandez, Mark Van Gampler, and Bill Rovers. They have agreed to take on the challenge of reviewing our constitution top to bottom and uh, taking suggestions from the membership on what the membership <coughs> would like to see uh, as a result of that review. So, if you have a suggestion as a member that you would like to see reviewed uh, in part of this Constitution review, that needs to go to Carlos Hernandez. Where can we see our Constitution? Is it on the website? It is on the website under resources, click on resources, and our Constitution is right there. So if you want to take a look at it, if you have any areas that you want uh, specifically addressed, whether it's news, whether it's appeals, whether it's whatever you want, any suggestions that you want uh, more attention to pay to, uh, please email those to Carlos Hernandez, who will then get with Mark Van Gampler and Bill Rovers. By the 27th of January, they're going to come forward with any suggestions that they think they've heard and that are appropriate for the membership. So before the end of this season, we will have definite proposals. We will follow Robert's rules of orders when those proposals are brought, and we will do it the right way. So, on that note, I owe the membership an apology for my lack of leadership last week and the way I let that meeting get out of hand with the Constitution uh, issues that we discussed. So, uh, I won't let that happen again, and uh, I'll try and move forward uh, from here. John, I think, uh, so as far as my proposal goes with the Appeals Committee, I'm withdrawing my proposal, and I think John has. Some similar language you wanted to talk to me yeah, about. Based upon some of the com uh, comments that were made last week about my proposal, and uh, and based upon the review committee, I'm going to withdraw. I'm, I don't know if I'm withdrawing it, but I'm I'm going to uh, mark it uh, motion, and it was seconded to table it till this meeting. And I would like to actually table it further. Uh, until the review committee or the Constitution Committee has a chance to look at it. But 
it's not a dead issue as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, it just needs to be looked at in scope or in light of the Constitution overall. Makes sense. Uh, so, again, if you have any suggestions, ideas, thoughts, Carlos Hernandez. We'll give us another suggestion. Real quick, uh, talk about our website. Um, one of the things in the off season that a lot of you emailed me about was our website and how um, we probably are due for an upgrade, a uh, new an update, uh, make it more user friendly, make it uh, accurate, more relevant, more relevant have it uh, a go to place for information, whether that's videos, plays, meeting minutes, uh, executive board minutes, things like that. And so, uh, Andy Heo has graciously agreed to be the website man. Um, him and Mr. Lutz are going to get together on, on how we can update and upgrade our website. They're going to be working on that, and hopefully we will have a brand new website on January 1st, uh, 2014. That's our goal right now. Um, Andy is going to reach out to people who he thinks he can rely on to help him if he needs help. If you have content that you would like to see, uh, on the website, send that to Andy. Andy's going to be kind of a go-between between, between uh, if he thinks it needs to be looked at by a second or third person to get on the website. He's going to take care of that. But Andy's going to be the, the main point of contact for the website. And we'll hopefully have a brand new website uh, January 1st. Um, so real quick, uh, last week, uh, Bob and myself and Gary and Shelly Rush met with the uh, Pikes Peak Athletic, Athletic Conference coaches and the Power Spring Country League coaches and anybody else who wanted to come to those coaches meetings. And um, one of the things in the offseason that several of you emailed me about or asked me about was safety of officials. Um, and being a police officer, I don't, I don't take it lightly. I think it's serious. I think it's something that uh, needs to be addressed. And I did that at the coaches meetings. And I did it in a way where I think there's things that we can do as officials to help ourselves uh, with safety. And I think there's things that coaches and site administrators can do uh, to help us out with that. So I approached it that way to, to hopefully not make it seem like it's all on them. But I think there's some things that we can do as well. So I'm going to run through just a few slides here real quick on what I talked to them about. Um, one of the main things was locker rooms, uh, having secure locker rooms that um, that we know we're going to be secure when we're in there changing, especially for female officials. Um, you know, I think sometimes uh, when we have split crews, males and females working together, the females get shoved off into the, oh, I didn't know we had a female official tonight. Um, let's put you in this coaching locker. And then all of a sudden, the female official's changing, and gets locked in on whatever. And I, and I don't, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to beat that to death, but that was one of the things I talked to the coaches about, having secure locker rooms. One of the main things that I think um, they can do better, and I told them I think they can do better, is get us on and off the floor. I think um, it's not so much a matter of getting on the floor, but certainly getting off the floor at halftime and at the end of the game. We all know that there's nothing worse when you just got done working a tight ball game, walking off the floor to your locker room, and you're standing there. And you're standing there, and the fans are walking around, the parents are walking around. Um, one thing I, I the, the example that I use for the coaches in the in the cop world, when you're at the front door of a bad guy, knocking on his door to arrest him, we'll say this is a sidewalk up to his house, right? This is what we call the fatal funnel. If a bad guy wants to get you, he knows you're going to come this way to his door, and that's where he's going to get you. On a basketball floor, if we walk off the floor here, let's just use. Um, Vista Ridge, for example. You gotta go through here, you gotta go down here, you gotta go to this hallway, and the coach's office is here. My main concern, and I told the coaches this, is this fatal funnel right here, which extends, obviously. Getting us off the floor at halftime is the end of the game. So, I brought that to their attention. Get us off the floor. Escort us off the floor. And fans, um, I think a lot of times game administrators get caught watching the game. Um, and they don't necessarily do a great job of eyeballing fans who are uh, obviously showing that their intent is to harass officials during the game. So I ask them to keep a closer eye on fans and try to identify those people who stick out quickly and take care of them and handle them early. If 
where it gets to be a big problem. Um, talk about locker rooms, that's more off and close to the monitor the fans. Sorry, I didn't have my slide there on time. Some things that I told them that we can do as officials to help ourselves. Make sure you're identifying game management when you walk into that gym, whether it's a freshman game, JV, or varsity. Ask somebody there, who's my game manager? Who do I go to if I have a problem? Make sure you're doing that. <clears throat> Tell that game administrator, hey, here's what I expect. Is our locker room going to be secure? Are you going to walk us off the floor at halftime at the end of the game? And it's, I don't think it's unreasonable to lay out those expectations at the beginning of the game or before the game even starts. Leave the floor together at halftime at the end of the game. I think sometimes we get caught up and we turn our backs on our partners and we walk off the floor in a hurry and we turn around and we, we realize we're alone. So do a better job of walking off the floor as a crew. And I think that's one thing that we can do to get better. Same thing at the end of the game. And leave the venue together. I think this is probably the most important most, most important spot. A lot of times the fans who get the, the angriest and the loudest are going to hang out in the gym. And they're going to wait for you. And they may not be waiting there to jump you out or whatever, but they're certainly going to wait for officials to come out to give them the last piece of their mind. And the example I have up there, uh, Caracano and Greg Davis and I worked the playoff game down at Pueblo County last year. Mesa Ridge, Pueblo County boys. And... It was a tight game, pretty contested game. We did, I thought we did a decent job, but when we walked out of that locker room, really looked down here, members, we had to walk through the gym, and there were several people there waiting for us. But look how he lost the game, and John made me come in and tell you he was going to get shanked. But. <laughs> 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 oh, <laughs> no, but that, I thought that it was a good, a good example because we walked out together, and uh, I think that's important. Some guys who don't shower after the game, you got to ask me why that. Well, if you don't have one, I understand. But sometimes guys are like, oh, I'm not going to shower. I'm out of here. We'll see you guys later. Wait the 10 minutes for your partners. And if you have a female partner on your crew, you find that female partner before you leave the venue. Okay? Don't leave them to fend for themselves. Find your partners and leave together. This is the biggest one that I told them that I would address the membership on. We're not to engage fans. I know it's hard, and I'm guilty of doing it. Whether it's a look, whether it's a smile, or whether it's an all-out conversation with somebody sitting on the front row in the bleachers. Don't engage the fans, please. Don't engage the fans. It adds fuel to the fire, it looks unprofessional, it takes your attention away from the basketball game, and it doesn't do anything good. Nothing. So I told them we'd work on that, as long as they're working on the things I asked them to work on. Um, safety's big, guys, um, for me, you guys pay any amount of attention, I'll get to you, Sandra. Uh, officials get assaulted. And I hope it doesn't happen to this group. Um, so just be aware of your surroundings and, and do, do the small things to try to help your own safety out. Sandra. Did the coaches think that we engage fans? Um, was that a complaint of that? It wasn't a complaint. It came up in the conversation. Okay. Um, it was just a, a topic. It wasn't a, a not a complaint. Right. So I, just, I just think it's something that we can do our part to avoid trouble. And that's all I got. Thanks, Greg. Uh, for the assignments quarter, we're going to change the uh, format uh, for this evening. Uh, I'd like to introduce a uh, uh, my 2 a assignment where he's going to give you his philosophy on the time process of the Black Bulls League as well. And, uh, uh, if you're new here, and I know we, we do have some new people, we have three assigners. I assign a 1A, 2A league called the Black Forest League. Years ago, it was called Beyond the Farmland. <laughs> remember that. Uh, Bob Markham, who used to be a member of this group and works out of Buena Vista, a really good official. He assigns the 3A tri Peaks League. And uh, Bob assigns the 4A, 5A, uh, what do we call that? We call it the Metro Pike Peak League. 4A is Pike Peak, 5A is the Metro League. Is that the way it works? The Pike Peak at Lake Conference and the Colorado Springs Metro League is 4A, 5A. Okay. So uh, there are three of us. Each one of us has uh, a different league. Uh, 
Uh, Black Horse League is an old, old league. Started, uh, as I understand, in the late 40s. I first worked in the Black Horse League in December of 1965. I loved that league. I was a small town boy in Iowa growing up, and that, that league out there uh, uh, was a good fit for me. I think if you get a full varsity schedule, an ideal thing for you is to have about a third BFL, a third tri peaks, and maybe a third uh, 4A, 5A. That gives you a pretty good uh, rounded schedule. You don't see too many teams uh, too many times. Um, Black Forest League has two A's, two A schools, and we have one A schools. Some of our two A schools are in town. Uh, CSS and ECA are two of our two A schools in town. We've got two A schools way the heck out east. We've got uh, Callahan, we've got Kiowa, we've got Peyton, um, out of Miami. We've got 1A schools in town. Pikes Peak Christian is a 1A school. We've got SEPA, which is a charter school. We've got d, &D in town. Uh, and then we've got a lot of 1A schools way the heck gone and back. <laughs> so, uh, I can't tell you how grateful the league is, and I personally am, that you guys are so willing to go way the heck uh, for instance, out to Edison. How many people have been to Edison? A few so, times. Yeah, raise your hand if you've not been. <laughs> how, many, how many people have been to Hugo? How many people have never been to Hugo? I was going to say, if Blizzard's in Hugo, if Blizzard's in Addison, who was the crew last year that was you and Dale and Dale here? And was that a luxurious motel in downtown Hugo? <laughs> Four star. An interesting um, thing that Bill was talking about. I've talked to some of the several of the Black Forest League uh, ADs. And it's a smaller, a lot smaller schools. A lot of those guys are the AD and they're the coach and. They got to run the concessions and who knows what they do. The BFL as a whole, I don't think, does a good job in securing uh, officials and taking care of it. Calhan, where I live, is one of the worst. And I got that, we've got a new AD there, and I've got him to get people a new place at the other end of the gym. So in Calhan, you don't have to walk through the the cafeteria and all that was going on that uh, people there. Um, I don't know if you've ever thought about how many guns are in the gym here in town, but I can tell you in Calhoun and Simba and Miami, there are more guns there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where the guns are in town. Bill can probably tell you that, but. In Simla, the guns are in the boots. Have <laughs> <laughs> you ever seen anybody try to pull up their legs? Probably one of them. I've assigned Black Forge League games 17 years, and they charge me with getting the best possible officials I can get for them. And what I've tried to do is uh, I send out a deal. Ask them to give me the 20 most preferred officials, right? Each each coach, boys and girls, each school. I don't get all of those back. I get most of those back. Some of them put 20 names down. Some of them put eight names down. Some of them put 12 names down. But from all those names I get back, from their preference list, I make a league preference list. 
And to tell you the truth, there's not very many people on that preference list. You would think maybe there would be 50 or 60, but there is about 25, 32. They all pick the same people. Name recognition is big. If you've been around a long time um, and they know you, um, your chances are you're going to be on that uh, preference list. Every year, though, uh, one or two new names crop up on that preference list that weren't there before. Um, Mr. Hufford is one name that cropped up on that preference list this year that hadn't been there before. Uh, yeah, I asked, I asked, I asked coaches to give me a lot of feedback. And some coaches give me a lot of feedback about officials. Some coaches never ever give me any feedback about coaches. I also asked them to uh, they can give me up to five names of people they absolutely don't want. And total out of the whole league, some years I only get one or two or three names. Some of those, a couple of those names have been on there forever. We <laughs> <laughs> uh, used to have a guy at Calhan who he used to uh, he blackballed some really good guys. He blackballed uh, Mr. Lance. He blackballed Mr. Riker. Is Mr. Riker here? Yeah, right here. Yeah. He blackballed Richard Gray just because Richard Gray called him stupid. I cannot understand. <laughs> Why? That happens. And there's a guy in our league that blackballs Mr. Montel from 25 years ago. <laughs> and he's still on that guy's list. <laughs> so uh, that's how I make my preference list. And I don't, I'm not sure if you know about the draw, but when we have the draw, uh, if I get first choice, we alternate who gets first choice each night. If I get first choice, I don't get to pick all of my people. If I need 24 officials on a Saturday night, I only get to pick a third to begin with. And then Bob Markham gets to pick a third of what he needs, and Mr. Lancey gets to pick a third of what he needs, and he may need 48 officials some night. So his third's way big. So that preference list, uh, even if I pick first, I may get a few people off that preference list. But I'm not going to get it. By the time it gets back around to me for my second third, I'm not going to get anybody off that preference list. That's my value to the BFL. That's why they got me to help them out to begin with 17 years ago. Because after the first 10 or 12 people that they knew, they didn't know anyone else. I know lots of other people. I get to watch a lot of people in freshman games, JV games, varsity games. And I have a network of people that I've worked with over the years and that I trust and I get lots of feedback from people about people they've seen that they think I could use. I also contact people who work with people that maybe I've got my eye on and ask them what they think. I get lots of feedback. Going to the uh, clinic Sunday, I got lots of feedback from two or three people about people they had worked with and uh, so forth. So after I get done with uh, people on my preference list, then I have discretion to pick the best possible people that I know from my experience. CNN, CNM and JV games, summer league, spring league, camp games, whatever. And what I do is then use my best gut feeling to put the best people in the right games. And uh, I love the Black Forest League because that's probably, if you're on your way up, that's the league where you probably will get your first varsity game. You're not going to get it probably in the 4A or 5A. Probably won't get it in the 3A. But you'll probably get your first party game at Elbert or Hanover or Edison or someplace like that. And hopefully I put you in the right game if it's your first game with the right people. And hopefully we don't get you. Our 1A, our 1A league is pretty bad. It's not real competitive. 
not a whole lot of skill. But oftentimes there's a lot of people there. Our 2A league is uh, a little more competitive. And so I try to put the right people on the right teams. Last year I used 113 different people in the BFL. I used every person that got selected for the state tournament worked in the BFL at least once last year. Um, coaches and some ADs in that BFL have a, uh, they think that a lot of us, they think a lot of us are too good or think we are too good to go into your BFL. And I think maybe that might be true with a very, very few of us. But as you saw how many people raised their hands, we, lots of good people work for us in the BFL. And I personally am, uh, am so grateful for that. Uh, I very seldom get complaints about uh, officials. One complaint I got more than once was we left the coach's office a mess with water bottles and tape and who knows. No matter what you lead, uh, what league you go to, if you dress in a coach's office, understand that that's somebody's office during the teaching field. So try not to leave. At least throw the water bottles in the waste paper basket and pick up our. That's a, that's that's the biggest thing I ever get from people. Every once in a while they'll complain about particular official. Not very often. Lots of times I hear from JV games or even varsity games, they people will call me, different coaches will call me and tell me, boy, they really liked this guy. They saw this guy. They really liked him. Can we get him back? Uh, is Ron Crump here? I didn't even know who Ron Crump was years ago. And he was working a JV game at Callahan. And the guy who was the AD, for some reason, was really impressed with him. Called me the next day. I had to go look on the schedule to see who the hell that was. That was so impressive. I was some guy named Ron Crump. That's when he was just beginning. I didn't I hardly even knew who he was. And Zoom. He uh, took off from there. Uh, Rachel Martinez is another one. The coach called me about. Uh, I knew who she was, but I got one or two or three calls about Rachel Martinez. The guy in Hugo <laughs> loves you, Rachel, as you well know. <laughs> and he would take her every week <laughs> if they could get out of there. And if you get to go to Hugo with Rachel, she brings food. <laughs> God bless her for that. So, um, hey, the downside is there's people, there's people who want to work games, and we wouldn't want that any other way. I think. But there's people who want, why didn't I pick them? Why don't I pick them more? Why don't I pick them for better games? Uh, why don't I pick them for big games? And uh, and I, I don't mind people calling and talking to me once or twice probably mind it if they call every week or so. But uh, maybe I've overlooked some people. Maybe I sometimes people call and maybe I need to take a better look and reevaluate and get some more input from other people. Because every once in a while I probably uh, do overlook people. So uh, that's the downside. You hate, um, you know, you hate when people call you or email you or say, hey, I, I should have some games. I should, you know, we've got a lot of people. I try to do my best. I try to get as many people as I can. But if I screwed up, don't be afraid to drop me a line or call and uh, we'll do our best to reevaluate. Um, any questions or anything about that? We have a uh, Good looking blonde here whose husband is a, a coach in the BFL. And uh, probably one of the better coaches. Would you say he's one of the better coaches? <laughs> 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 and uh, I get feedback from him. I get feedback from a lot of people. Uh, a lot of 
ADs and a lot of coaches. And some you never hear from. And some guys have been coaching in that league five, six, seven years. I never once heard a thing from them about anything one way or another. Anything else I can add or uh, I, I would just like to say I'm pretty sure I know the reason I was blackballed. They got Ron Hall and I confused. <laughs> <laughs> They thought you were fast. <laughs> 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 well, I'd like to say again how grateful I am uh, that you guys are willing to work in this league. I know they are very grateful that you are willing to work in this league. Um, I think you, do you want to talk about that big scrimmage, uh, Aiden, a little bit later that's in our league? And that's it. Yeah, I got a play of the week. R1 and R2 are at this very fancy restaurant. R1, R2. R2 looks over and says, How was your day? R1 looks back and says, My day was fine. R2 says, This is a very romantic dinner. I really appreciate that. R1 says, Well, I hope you appreciate it. R2 says, You smuck. You forgot my anniversary again. Like it, Bob. Disqualification. What do you think? Play on, or you get disqualified. Play on. If you're interested in the Iowa insurance, it's $7.50. Uh, one of the benefits of the Iowa insurance is game reimbursement. You get about $2,000, maximum $2,000 of game reimbursement. That's probably really the true benefit of that. $7.50 for the whole year. If you're interested, come see me. Give me a check or cash for $7.50. I'll get you signed up uh, tomorrow. Sub varsity assignments um, will be out November 18th. I'm still trying to match up the new officials with some senior officials and uh, quite an ordeal but about 75 percent finished with that uh, process and i'll guarantee you that on monday the 18th i'll have that published so please do not send me an email saying how come i get only got one game we haven't done any games whatsoever just understand that it's still a very long process for me to get that done uh, we, like Gary said, we met with the coaches, the Pike Peak Athletic Conference, and then Andrew Mitchell and all the other coaches showed up. One of the one of the concerns that the coaches have is communication, and they're concerned the fact that there's a call in one area or outside the area, and responding back by saying, "That's not my call. It's not in my area." And coaches are hearing that often, so let's try to work on additional verbiage. Okay, here's a good one. Shut up and sit down. <laughs> it's probably a language that we shouldn't speak. Okay? So let's just remember that. Maybe we can not say that or not even acknowledge that. The other thing that people are concerned about is that when you ask a question, you get no response. If you don't want to verbally respond to their question, just nod your head. Go like this, or go like this, or do something. Acknowledge them, that's what we want you to do, okay? Or if there's a disagreement in a play, maybe we can use these terminology. See, I got that play right, coach. Or we can say, well, if we saw that play differently, we'll take a better look at it next time. Or maybe this statement we could use, but only use it once. Yeah, I missed that call. I kicked it, but I'll work harder for it. Okay. Coaches want us to be transparent. They want us to do our jobs. They want us to appreciate. Leave your egos at the front door. Leave your troubles at the front door. Come officiate. Be motivated and do a good job. Because those coaches are the ones that vote for you for postseason. 
or they'll call me or they'll call Ray or call Bob Markham and say, boy, that tree you sent us the other night, it was horrible. And then we'll get game film and then we have to spend an hour looking at game film and everything else. And then if you work in my leagues, you'll, you'll get a phone call from Bob and you'll say, hey, let's do lunch or something. We'll have to talk about the game and everything else. But the way I look at it, it's a lesson learned. And uh, we'll make some mistakes out there. The other thing the coaches want us to do, they want us to know the rules. There was a situation at Pine Creek, multiple technical fouls, kind of rough play, a whole bunch of things happening, and the crowd was going crazy. Did not like the crew that was on there. So one of the guys gave a technical foul to a player on the floor. The coach goes, what was that for? That was a default technical foul. I challenge you to look in the rule book to see if that play is in the rule book. If it is, the default technical foul is in the rule book, I'll give you $100. <laughs> 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 that was good. So please, know the rules, know how to uh, enforce the rules, and don't make up stuff. But believe it or not, soldiers are much smarter than us in some rules that we talk. Okay? So please don't do this. Just a concern about the coach's box. We know there are some coaches that love to go out of the coach's box. One of our techniques is to kind of walk them back and everything else. And we know that if a coach gets really excited and yells and screams at you and takes four or five feet outside the coach's box, that that person should get whacked. But if he jumps up and down, he's like one inch outside the box, <coughs> let's use some common sense and not issue a technical foul. And many coaches are saying that that's what's happening because we end up with a verbal confrontation and we're looking for something to show the coach that, hey, you're not going to mess with me tonight. And this is my measure of showing you that I'm in charge. So one inch out of the box, I'm going to tee you up and you're not going to give me any crap anymore. So it's kind of go from there. Uh, the men's coaches and the women's coaches think that we're calling the game differently at the women's level. We may not allow the kids to work through some of the things as we do at the men's level. So the women's coaches are concerned that we're not letting the kids play. You know, they're trying to get ready for maybe the collegiate level and stuff like that. So let's try to make them play some basketball. Let them play through some tough stuff. But then they complain about if you don't call that, our kids are going to get hurt. You know, and you're like, mm -hmm. okay. Understand, coaches are very hard to please sometimes, but you can you can work through the game and you can understand the flow of the game. Let them play a little bit, and it gets out of control, and they start tightening up. Um, one of the other things here, you know, they think our association is a great association. We have some great basketball officials in, in Colorado Springs. Some of the coaches think that we call a game too tight in the Springs when we go to Denver. Sh uh, short of getting their wallet pickpocket out or shorts, uh, you know, the game is real physical up in Denver. So I'm not quite sure how we, how we can approach that subject, but Gary was attending an interpreters meeting on uh, Saturday with all the other 18 interpreters throughout the state, so maybe they can discuss that, why the game is being called differently in each territory. Well, you got, more you got better athletes in uh, Denver, Bob, overall. That's the main reason. Okay, well, probably, or the other avenue is maybe the, maybe the Denver Association is not educated enough to call it good basketball. Thank you. So I'll let Gary, I'll let Gary worry about that. Like, that's a good point. You know, maybe got their bigger, bigger, strong kids up in Denver than we have there in Colorado Springs. But uh, I'll let Gary worry about that. He's the interpreter, so we'll wait till the next meeting and he can come back with a discussion on that. Wow. Not to start putting you on the spot, but I think for the betterment of the group, I've heard this, what you said about the uh, partner that says, uh, you know, um, that wasn't in my area. Yeah. And you may not have an area, but just for the rest of the folks who may not experience a lot of that, um, maybe some of the other folks in the room could share some of the comments they come back with, because everybody seems to bring up that it's not a good thing to say it's not my area. But what are the good officials saying in that situation? I don't know. Let's ask for uh, you know, maybe some other folks might have some input on when they're in that situation. What's, a, what's better to say? We rotate a lot in this game, so they'll be around here in a minute. We can talk to them then. By then, they've forgotten all about it. Anybody else share their thoughts on that? 
Anybody else share your thoughts? <laughs> I, I usually, if there's a situation like that, I want to see how you do that. And I think that's a fixing issue. How long do I need to sit in my car to go over to the test? And that's kind of what I'm going to say, you know, in that situation, if I get a good look to, I, I personally be honest, I didn't have, I didn't see it. I'm looking in this area right here. I'm concentrating on this area that you and I are looking at. And then I also offer, you know, if you really need to know, coach, maybe we can get them over here next day ball and talk to you, you know. And that way, that official takes ownership of that particular call. I don't necessarily have to explain to that coach, you know, what it is that I even might think he had or did not have. So um, that's my little take. Yeah, I told the coaches that, you know, this is not softball or baseball and they have a play at first base or the, the two umpires can meet together and say, full court or uh, juggle or whatever. Or in football, you know, you can get together and pick up a couple of flags and go like this and play penalty. You know, I mean, basketball, the decision is made like that. I would recommend that you don't use that verbiage. That's not my area. I'm not making yeah. a call. I would say, like, I hear you. I'll tell. I'll talk to my partner. If you're not in here, something like that. Or when that person's reporting a foul, you can kind of scoot up a little bit and say, hey, coach wants to talk to you. Exactly. On a dead ball situation. So you can approach it that way as well. I think as long as you tell the coach you hear them. Yeah, they just want to be heard. Because, you know, I did a, I did a quick analysis on what they do in their job. You know, they work real hard, they got families to worry about, they got a job to do, they got if they're a teacher, they got curriculum to worry about, then they gotta worry about their team, you know, they gotta worry about is this kid eligible, then they gotta worry about their opponents, you know, what what kind of record do they have, what you know, the strong the strong players, how they can compare to their opponent. And we as officials, we have jobs, we have families, we have we're in the rule book constantly, we're attending a basketball camps, we're either a, being a camper or a commission. We're always basketball thinking during the season. So we're prepared for that ball game, just like they're prepared. And I told them that, and we're working just as hard as you guys are. We're not just out there to say, screw this stuff, and I'm going to screw Sanctuary tonight, I'm not going to make any calls. So that's not going to happen. But there's nobody in this room that will do that. Because we have so much integrity in this association that we're, we're not looking after you. We don't have any voting requirements in this association either. We don't do that in this association. We don't do that. We go, we go to work. And we work very, very hard. So those are the kind of comments we got from the coaches. And, uh, you know, as Gary goes through the interpreters meeting, he'll get a feel for what the other areas are doing as well. And Tom Wolfs is going to be here for all of this. Um, so we're uh, looking forward to hearing what Gary has to say that morning. Any questions? All right. Thanks a lot. We're happy to hear from you. Opportunity to work a scrimmage, uh, CSCS boys and Lutheran boys scrimmage before the playoffs, just to get some work in. And, and uh, I got the opportunity to referee that game, and they paid us for it. They paid us thirty-five dollars. I don't want to give that back because it was just a, it was a fun game. Um, it was just a good opportunity, but I'm gonna give it back. So if you ask your red ticket, whoever draws the wing ticket, I'm gonna pay your local dues with that thirty-five dollars. So, Gary, go ahead and draw a ticket. <laughs> Six zero five one two eight. He needs it. <laughs> he got a job. He's always late. Wow. <laughs> He's early on. All right. Thank you. you bet. <laughs>
communicate with that coach and with your partners, and we are not the end of the world. Check your ego. Have fun and just be. Sometimes we're too tight and we're too mandated. Soft and gentle sometimes is better than authoritarian ways. So there's ways to do this cool thing. If we get in the right place, we can make the right thing. You know, uh, as you know, I'm, I'm injured and I'm really depressed about not having any games. Could you so, get your turn back, Gary? So, you know, in December, we, we talk about getting better and feedback. I've, I've got this new camera and I've got a video machine and uh, I'm available to come and watch you if you value some of my experience and stuff. So uh, just email me, Gary, can you come on December 1 or December 10 or November 30th or whatever? I'll be glad to. I'm going to be at Whitefield on the 30th. Hope somebody will join us. We're there for that scrimmage. Thanks, John. A uh, good friend of mine, Greg Burks, 18 years NCAA basketball official. He gave me this advice that I've used a couple times. When you blow a call, is tell you tell the coach, coach, it probably wasn't my best call. That's a good one. Okay, I've used that a couple times. Right. Uh, scrimmages. Uh, Bob sent out the scrimmage list. We have 20 of them. Okay. Uh, we need your help. Okay, we've got a lot of scrimmages out there. Look at that list, figure out where you can work if you can. We'd like to have everybody work some scrimmages. Okay, if you haven't been on the court since the end of last year, it'd be a good opportunity for you to get out and work your skills a little bit. All the folders are up here, and I'm still looking for some site supervisors on some of these dates. Okay, so uh, take a look at that. Uh, my Ray Lutz story, I first year, 10 years ago, I was in this association, and uh, my good friends Greg Burks and John Caracas told me, you need to go to camp. So I went to a Dave Hall camp, and they said, you've got to get Ray Lutz to evaluate. Okay, so he's at the registration booth, right? I say, hey, Mr. Lutz, uh, good friend of mine, Greg Lutz, John Caracas told me that I need to have you evaluate and drop a few names on it, right? So he says, okay, no problem. I've never done a three-man game, right? I'm a new official. I'm in the Wyoming camp, I'm in the field house, you know that carpenter. There's Ray Lutz, my first game. I'm like, oh no, come on. Not my first game, first three-man game. I was so berserk, I had no idea what I was doing. I was calling out of bounds on the end line, I was betrayed. I, I was like out of control. I was running up and down like crazy. That but still happens. After, yeah. after the game, Ray Lutz came up to me and said, hey, I think I can use you. <laughs> and, and then the funniest thing happened. I'm sitting there, I'm totally exhausted because, of course, I didn't go to camp in shape, right? And uh, Doran Gotchel is the next evaluator on the court, right? And this guy from Wyoming, in the first two minutes of the game, blows his knee up. And Doran Gotchel looks at me and goes, Hey, put your shoes back on, put your shirt on, you need jogging. I'm like, Thank you. Thank you. Me? No, no, not me. Not me. No. Well, where'd those guys go that I just came from? He said, they left. Said, no, go check. You're out in the hall. We got to keep going. Like, Get out of here. And I have to run two games in a row. Totally crazy. But Doran Gotts is a pretty smart guy. He gets done. He's got the evaluation sheet. He's only got two calls. He's looking at me. He says, I, I didn't evaluate you. <laughs> He's a pretty smart guy. But anyhow, if you want to get in the Black Horse League, the, the gate is through Ray Lux. And a, a good way for you to do that, if you want to do that, Peyton has the largest scrimmage going. On Saturday, uh, November 23rd, they've got 12 teams coming to Peyton High School. Okay? We need lots of help. Ray is going to be there all day long. Okay? If you want to get looked at, you want to do some games at the Black Forest League, Go to Peyton on Saturday, November 23rd. We don't have nearly enough officials to run those scrimmages. They're going to be at the middle school. They're going to be at the high school. Okay, 12 teams are going to be there. Okay, so need your help. All right. Like to see everybody do at least a couple uh, games on the scrimmages. Okay. Any, anything else, Mike? Yep. Yeah. Uh, two, uh, two of the places, Peyton High School and Air Academy High School, are going to put out uh, 
donation uh, deals for uh, the teams so they can donate for our cancer fund. So we'd like to really support uh, Peyton and Eric Adams. Okay? All right? Got a couple of officials who weren't here last week that we want to recognize for the same Nick Levay.